Hi, I'm Adam Shepherd. And I'm Jane McCallion. Welcome to another episode of the IT Pro Podcast, your weekly guide to the most important topics in the IT industry. Adam, have you been shopping? I have not been shopping. Because it is Black Friday today. It is indeed the day of deals, or more accurately, the week, or even more accurately, the fortnight. Soon to be pretty much the entire month, just deals, 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 well, all month long. At least one place already has a uh, Black November event, which is an uh, exciting name. Mm, yeah, just. <laughs> uh, so our colleagues on Expert Reviews have been busily updating deals pages and there's just a flurry of activity throughout the building it's a very exciting time absolutely if you are actually genuinely looking for some deals do check out uh, expertreviews.co.uk because they have loads on there that it's worth looking at mm. if you're interested in some more businessy deals uh, we have our own deals uh, courtesy of dell who are offering some great deals on laptops, servers, and monitors. That'll be in the show notes if you're looking for a bargain. Not every day you get a server on a sale. Mm, isn't it just? That'll make a nice Christmas present for someone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a power edge, just what I've always wanted. How do you fit it under the tree? In a big box. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so later in the show, we will actually be discussing servers and multi cloud and their role therein. But first, we have. A lot of exciting news to talk about. We do. And our first story this week is about uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. Not the internet, crucial distinction. Uh, No, that would be uh, the predecessor to the NSA and uh, ARPA. Mm. Yes. So he is the inventor of the World Wide Web. And he has hit out once again about the way that the uh, modern web is used. So Sir Tim has, in association with the World Wide Web Consortium, launched the Contracts for the Web initiative, which is essentially a code of conduct for web operators and web companies and big tech companies to make the internet nice again, effectively. (laughs) Essentially, Make the internet great again. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure how nice it ever was in the first place, but nevertheless, he's taking aim at some of the big topics of the moment. You know, fake news, political manipulation, all very topical, given mm-hmm. that we are coming up to a general election ourselves. Yep. And but- privacy violations, that kind of thing. Apparently, he wants to stop it from becoming a digital dystopia. Which you know, digital life is real life, so real mm. life dystopia. Well, quite. And that phrase, digital dystopia, is one that he's used repeatedly. Uh, So the contract for the web is essentially a set of nine guiding principles uh, with three principles each for individuals, governments, and private companies. The contract has been signed up to by more than 150 organizations, including big tech giants like Facebook, Reddit, Google, uh, all of whom have given their seal of approval. And Reddit, indeed, who have been a uh, at the centre of a lot of the uh, fake news stuff, particularly in the run up to the last presidential elections. However, there is one notable missing person or p- company, rather. There is indeed. Amazon is notably absent, uh, which is interesting. We'll see where it goes. You know, this the initiative might not go anywhere. To be fair, um, Amazon might sign up at a later date. You, you don't know, but yes, they are notable by their absence. The thing with initiatives and codes of conduct like this is they're very easy to uh, agree to uh, for governments and, in particular, tech companies. But they're non-binding. Essentially, essentially, Facebook is just pinky swearing that it'll be nice. Yeah. And there's absolutely nothing compelling it to adhere to the principles of this other than decency. Yes, yes. And good, uh, good PR, really. You, know, you, you want to look good in front of your um, investors, in front of your users. But realistically, I mean, you know, not wishing to pick on Facebook but um, you know their decision not to do anything really about misleading political ads flies a little in the face of them signing up to this contract. Yeah, like you say, it's non-binding and initiatives like this, like, great, but let's see. So from Tim Berners-Lee wanting to make the internet a better place, we move on to the Conservative Party. Yes, who want to make the internet a bigger place. Mm. 
So yes, this is their resurrected plan to bring super fast and gigabit capable internet uh, to the entire nation of the United Kingdom by 2025, which uh, listeners will note is just five years and about six weeks away. So not very long at all. So we mentioned this in our last episode where we talked about Labour's ambitious free broadband plan. Mm. So this is uh, notably different in a number of ways. Firstly, it's not a promise of free broadband, Mm. uh, just increased infrastructure investment. But it is still very ambitious. In fact, it's more ambitious than Labour's plan Uh, which is to deliver gigabit connectivity by 2030. So it's five years faster in terms of timeline than Labour's plan. Although it should be noted that it involves less work than Labour's. It doesn't involve nationalising openreach. Yeah, which does uh, take time in itself. It is interesting, like I say, this is a resurrected plan because uh, Boris Johnson... He promised this in his bid to become leader of the Conservative Party. And then when it got to the Queen's speech following his uh, election, it disappeared. And now it's back. Well, actually, this is the, I think, third or fourth time that this has appeared in the Conservative manifesto. It was originally proposed by Theresa May Mm -hmm. uh, and was promised with the date of 2033, Which is Uh, so specific. Yeah, I know. Weirdly specific. Um, Which Boris Johnson at the time called, quote, laughably unambitious Mm -hmm. and then brought it forward to 2025 before quietly dropping it uh, in time for the Queen's speech. And then bringing it back. And then bringing it back. Yeah. I mean, when you read the Conservative Party manifesto, which I did when I wrote our news piece on this, The promise is rolled into a far more general bit about infrastructure. The place where it sits is largely about uh, roads, actually. Roads, buses, that kind of thing, plus also some internet. Uh, Which means that this isn't costed in the way that the Labour one is. Now, uh, at the time of recording, it looks like we will get a Conservative majority. That's according to the most recent set of polls from YouGov. Yes. I think whether or not we do, or rather irrespective of whether or not we do, I would be surprised if we have national gigabit capable uh, internet to every home and business, because that's that's a lot of infrastructure to lay. Mm. The UK is two major land masses, plus an awful lot of islands. So, you know, kind of, it would be great. As I said last week, it would be great, but good luck on that. Our final story is the news that Uber has lost its license to operate as a taxi operator in London. Yes, so the company has had a very tumultuous relationship with Transport for London. And indeed many other transport regulators around the globe. Yes, and was threatened with having its license rescinded but was given a two-month reprieve. However, Transport for London, so TFL from here on out for shortness, has effectively rescinded the licence on grounds of safety. Now, what was found was that um, effectively drivers were being banned, but then they were just using other drivers' logins, uploading their picture, and so carrying on driving. The safety net just was more like a giant safety hole, really. There was everything was slipping through the cracks. So essentially, Uber drivers were operating like that one spongy friend who has been using your Netflix login for three (laughs) years, except with taxi operators, which is, you know, slightly more worrying. Yes, yes. And especially considering they were actually, you know, they were chucked off the platform for being dangerous. Now, to my mind, when I first read the uh, write up that we got from Connor Jones, our staff writer, I was just like, why was the company as big and like tech forward as uber not using something as basic as facial recognition i am not like full-on let's cover everything in cctv and facial recognize everyone you know there's been big problems with uh, with that that we've seen in wales for example with the police force but with this it's just like you have pictures of people your main way to recognize who is operating on your platform is through these faces really Mm. and so you should have some kind of capability 
of you, your platform recognising who's who. And if there is a face swap and it matches somebody who was kicked off for whatever reason. Hmm. I mean, if not facial recognition, then at the very least, some other form of biometrics like fingerprint scanning. I mean, we've had both facial recognition and fingerprint scanning on consumer smartphones for years now. There Mm. is really no reason at all why Uber couldn't have implemented these kind of safeguards at scale. It really is bizarre. I think that, you know, it's the main criticism that they face is that the platform could be unsafe. They don't have much oversight of their drivers. This is a super simple way to deal with it. I just I just don't understand. Well, it should be noted that Uber has now promised to roll out a quote-unquote facial matching system uh, for exactly this purpose. <laughs> but the, the fact remains that it could have, and in all honesty should have, done this years ago sure it's a mature company why has it not done you know it's not a startup anymore Mm. why hasn't it done it already i mean props to them for doing it but yeah so we're going to take a short break now but when we come back we will be joined by staff writer bobby hellard to discuss the ins and outs of multi-cloud architectures join us after the break Hello, I'm Ollie Mann, and every Friday on The Week Unwrapped, we cover the stories you might have missed with journalists from theweek.co.uk. It's all the big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. That's The Week Unwrapped with me, Ollie Mann, available now for free from all good podcast apps. And welcome back. And we are now joined by Bobby Hellard, who is our staff writer. Bobby, hello. Hello, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. Bobby is our resident cloud expert, and we are going to be chatting today about multi-cloud architectures, what they are, why they're important, and the role that they have in modern business. So, Bobby, what is multi-cloud? Well, it's it's multiple cloud providers, multiple services from different uh, large companies that provide cloud. So you'll have to forgive a cynical old person here, but is it just <laughs> a uh, a buzzword for hybrid cloud? No, uh, hybrid cloud obviously is on-premise and off-premise cloud services, whereas multi-cloud is can be any of the two sort of mixes. So it can be either multiple public cloud providers, uh, multiple private cloud setups, mm, a mix of private and public, basically any kind of combination of any of the cloud systems that are available. Multi-cloud is something that a lot of the big vendors have been talking about. Uh, Dell and HPE in particular have been going big on the idea of of multi-cloud. What advantages does a multi-cloud system have for businesses versus just going with a single cloud provider? Uh, the biggest benefit is obviously choice because you're not locked into one vendor and locked into one service. If you're with one company, they may not be able to provide every single thing you require as a business. Each business is obviously different. So whatever services they have may not be as good for you as they are for someone else. So multiple different providers, multiple different services, different capabilities, different qualities. So a lot of vendors are quite keen on multi-cloud. Uh You were recently at Google Cloud Next 2019 in London, and they have their big Anthos play for multi-cloud. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Anthos is and how it works? So it's Google Cloud Platform rebranded as a more open uh, multi-cloud service where it can have multiple providers. Without clashing. Yeah, on their own platform. Oh, nice. And you are off uh, on another conference this week coming. You are going to uh, Amazon Web Services reInvent. Does Amazon have its own multi-cloud play or uh, are they not getting in on the action? Uh, Well, no. Uh, From what it looks like, Amazon are quite Um, anti-multi-cloud. Anti-cloud, if you will. (laughs) (laughs) So there's a recent uh, PDF for partners and you you have to have a partner login to see it. But they're uh, <laughs> they ban the word from partners. The so word multi cloud. They ban not that just not just multi cloud. Multi cloud, cross cloud, any cloud, every cloud, and my favourite, any language that implies design or supporting more than one cloud provider. <laughs> <laughs> it's all getting a little bit. Their, 
One Amazon. Ring over here, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> isn't it just? <laughs> Amazon clearly doesn't play nicely with others. Oh, yeah, why do you think that is? Because it's you know, they're still the biggest player in the cloud market. Why would they not want to get in on what is clearly the biggest trend at the moment? Well, I think you've kind of answered your own question there to a certain extent. I mean, they are the biggest vendor in the cloud market. Why would they encourage people to diversify onto other providers? It's kind of out of their hands a little bit because as far as I know, multi-cloud is the most popular choice for most vendors. I think mm. uh, IBM study said it was 85% of companies use multi-cloud. So they don't really have much choice because people are going to use their services in that environment anyway. So do you think this is Amazon kind of effectively trying to throw its weight around a little bit in order to retain its place at the top of the pile? Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. It feels, I tell you what it feels like to me, is a bit, um, it's almost like Amazon are themselves becoming a legacy uh, company, which is kind of ironic because the whole like, you know, they disrupted the legacy environment by introducing uh, the idea of the public cloud. But if they're not willing to take on the idea of multi-cloud, then surely they're at risk of being disrupted themselves. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I talked in our episode on Windows 10 uh, about my personal uh, view that Azure is going to become a very serious challenger to AWS in the coming years for exactly that reason. The fact that Microsoft makes it very, very easy to deploy across multiple clouds, multiple environments, uh, as well as unifying all of your existing stack onto a cloud platform. Amazon really doesn't in the same way. So... Bobby, you were at AWS reInvent last year as well. What do you think the main kind of trends for this year are going to be? Bearing in mind that multi-cloud is evidently not going to be among them, which has played a major part in most of the other cloud conferences uh, over the past kind of year or so. What do you think is going to be the main focus this year for Amazon? Uh, well, they've already announced some uh, new updates before we head into uh, reInvent and they're mostly to do with IoT and machine learning. With the other cloud vendors, a lot of their announcements were for security for multi-cloud environments, some kind of security update maybe from Amazon, but it, like we just said, it won't be about multi-cloud. It'll be in some other guys. Because mm. they announced their Watchtower product or expansions to their Watchtower product last year, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that kind of makes sense to me as well, because Amazon has, uh, rightly or wrongly, come in for criticism regards security previously. It's not really their fault if people can't configure their S3 buckets properly. But at the same time, um, you know, putting in effort to add layers of security or defaults that are more secure. So I wonder if we won't see something around that as well. The, there is the other thing with security is all the other cloud vendors have put a lot of uh, effort into giving the customer more control. So uh, Box Shield launched earlier in the year and Google Cloud have done things with um, security keys and justification. Didn't they have a problem where they had to recall a bunch of their Titan security keys because they were found to be flawed? Yes, I believe that's correct. Beyond the benefits for redundancy and avoiding vendor lock-in, what are the main kind of operational benefits that companies can expect to see from multi-cloud deployments? Like, as a CIO, what can you take to the board in order to get buy-in for a multi-cloud strategy? Well, with these things, it depends on what you're using and who whose services you are using for cost reductions. I mean, like we just said, with Amazon, they don't favor multi-cloud, so their services might be a little bit more pricey. So it does depend on you know shopping around and getting the best deals. I think one of the interest, one of the most interesting trends we've seen with multi-cloud is the traditionally much more closed vendors, uh, the likes of Microsoft and companies like VMware, becoming much more open and much more collaborative and willing to work with their erstwhile rivals in order to kind of support these multi-cloud deployments. Do you think we're going to be seeing an era where pretty much every technology, with a couple of exceptions, is interoperable with kind of the equivalent bits from other providers? 
Probably, actually. Uh, I think so. You know, at the end of the day, you have to follow what the customer wants. Um, if one person gets in on the act, you you kind of have to do it to keep up with competition. So, yeah, I think so. You see it in, uh, in consumer areas. You're going to see it in business as well. I think touching on Jane's point earlier about Amazon being a, almost like a legacy company now is all the other companies are changing their strategy, like you mentioned with Microsoft, buying more and more companies for different services. They're looking at new ways of doing things. Like the IBM Red Hat deal was specifically to change their cloud approach. So it's just everyone else is changing, really, mm. evolving. So would you say that Amazon is not evolving as fast as some of its rivals? In a sense, yes. But then, as, as we've said, they're the biggest cloud provider. They don't necessarily need to. Well, Bobby, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to speak to us. Uh, your What to Expect is already on the website. We will link to that in the show notes. Uh, have a great time at reInvent. Really looking forward to seeing what comes out of it, whether it is multi-cloud or schmulti-cloud or uh, however else they're going to frame it. And uh, also <laughs> your view from the airport wrap-up at the end. Thank you. You can find links to all the topics we've spoken about today in the show notes and even more on our website, www.itpro.co.uk. You can also follow us on Twitter, where we are at ITPro, as well as Facebook and LinkedIn. You can also email us at podcast at itpro.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to the IT Pro podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you find podcasts to never miss an episode. And we'll be back next week with more news and analysis from the world of IT. Until then, goodbye. Bye.